Excellent. Oh, yes. Packed house. I love it. Um, okay, excellent. So, if, uh, Drew, if you don't mind, I've got a little clip I want to show first uh, of uh, TC50 when you guys are presenting Dropbox. So if we can roll that. Ready? Uh, let's yep. hear it for Dropbox. I'm hearing the audio. Oh, there it is. All right, thank you. I'm Drew, and this is Arash, and we're going to be showing you a quick tour of Dropbox. All right, it's 2008. It is still such a pain to do even the most basic things, like work across multiple computers, or share files across a team, or put photos and video up on the web. When we think about the future, it's kind of hard to imagine Tom Cruise having to carry around a USB drive or having to like log into Gmail to send himself a file or an email attachment. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, that was that was 2008. Um, this 2018 now. So that's you describing Dropbox in 2008. <laughs> How do you describe Dropbox uh, in 2018? Is it exactly the same? Is it different? Um, it has evolved. And so as as you saw there. Well, first, it's it's great to be back here. Welcome. Um, and uh, TechCrunch has been very good to us over the years, and um, and it's great to see all of you. So, yeah, in 2008, I mean, I think first, that that watching that clip made me like twitch a little bit because <laughs> like when we were about to go on stage at TC50, I think I was like on two hours of sleep. What they didn't show there was that the Wi-Fi then broke and the demo went totally off the rails. And I thought about like showing that. the demo fail, but <laughs> I didn't give you one. Yeah. So that's all part of the adventure. Um, but when we started back then, 2008, our, our mission was to move people's lives into the cloud. And fast forward to several years later and, and, and to now, and yeah, people don't need to carry around a thumb drive anymore. And, and we have helped a lot of people move into the cloud, and, and a lot of the, the internet companies have done that. Um, but along the way, we realized that a lot of people were bringing Dropbox into work, into millions of businesses, kind of without us doing anything. And when we looked at how at people's experience of using technology at work, we saw that there is, uh, it's similar to how there, it doesn't make a lot of sense to be carrying around a thumb drive, there's a lot of experiences uh, of using technology at work that are pretty broken. And so today, we talk about, or our mission is to design a more enlightened way of working. Um, and we can mean? talk about, so what does that mean? Well, I, at first, it, it means that the way we're working right now isn't terribly enlightened. Um, and what I mean by that is, I just think back uh, to, I visited my dad at work when I was a little kid. And when, and I, I was pretty excited, I look, I look on his computer, and I look at the tools he was using, he was using Office and email. And fast forward 20, 25 years later, and you look on a lot of people's screens, and you still see like a lot of Office and a lot of email, and we're still using a lot of the same tools. And we're using a lot of newer tools also, but it's been kind of this, avalanche of new stuff, and, and a lot of it's really distracting, nothing really works well together. Um, and it's kind of crazy because I, while on the one hand we'll, we all go to the, an office in, in the morning to go to work, more and more we're working out of a screen. And we all know how, a physical, how our physical environment can make us happier or more, more productive or not. Um, but the virtual, it's the same thing is true of our virtual environment, and in many ways it's more important. And you think about how that environment works, it's like we're cobbling together all these different tools uh, from different decades, from, from like Office and email to then we have old generations of new tools from the web and mobile and so on. Um, but I think one thing that's really different from when I visited my dad is even though we're using a lot of the same tools, he might have gotten like five emails a day. Mm -hmm. Now a lot of us get 500 emails a day. and so. Uh, that's a problem when for every, probably most of you in this room, most of your companies, their biggest investment or the biggest expense is really in people. And so we're hiring people for their minds and then because of the tools are so distracting and the experience is so fragmented, we don't then give them space to think. So you view Dropbox as an opportunity to help with that distraction level? Yeah, so first making a more organized experience, kind of reducing some of the fragmentation and then reducing some of the distraction and helping people drive, uh, help people steer their attention to what's important. So if you're not, if you're focused on not distracting people with Dropbox and saying, "Hey, we're going to take care of business without getting in your way," how do you remind people that you exist and then grow your user base? Well, fortunately, Dropbox we have over we have over 500 million registered users, and we're in millions of com or Dropbox is adopted in millions of companies, and so we have uh, a, we have a great head start in terms of solving this problem. And then second, Dropbox is the place where, where these people go to work. 
And so you think every, uh, millions of teams rely on Dropbox to have their most important information in there. Um, and pretty much anything you touch or anything you see or anything that's made, um, whether it's a table or a chair or a jewel, starts out as an idea and then start, often starts out as a file or a piece of content mm -hmm. on someone's computer. And more and more Dropbox is the home for that content. So we are starting with a pretty big head start. So if you're looking at, and let's talk a little bit more about product, then I want to kind of talk about uh, the process of, of going public, because I think that's it's in a, kind of in the news and in everybody's mind. But the, in terms of product, when you're thinking about um, how you evolve Dropbox, how you make it more uh, indispensable to the, your users, uh, you, it, like 2014, 2015, it seemed like you were headed directly towards a, a Google Docs or Office competitor. Like we we're going to build the full suite end to end, and then it, that went kind of that kind of disappeared. Mm -hmm. well, what happened there? Well, I t uh, we're certain we were trying to solve new problems. And when we look at the landscape, a lot of the things that we were working on, whether storage or photos or collaboration, um, there are certain p problems that were kind of, that were solved well. And so um, w by the time, like by 2015, a lot of people were not really carrying around thumb drives anymore. And so we kind of could declare victory on that problem. Right. Um, but when you look, but just still when you look at the experience of using Office or even uh, Google Suite, or any of the office suites today, they're based on some pretty old metaphors, right? In, in 2018, you probably wouldn't start out by designing a word processor based on a metaphor of literal sheets of paper, mm -hmm. right? And even the spreadsheet and PowerPoint are descended pretty, are pretty direct copies of a ledger or of a slide transparency. And so we have an opportunity because of our relative youth, um, to start with a blank slate and think about, all right, if you were to redesign these things for 2018, we have some pretty powerful building blocks that weren't available back in the mid-90s when a lot of these products were designed. And so Dropbox Paper in, is an example of that, where it's familiar, so if you know how to use Word or you know how to use Google Docs, you know how to use Dropbox Paper, but instead of just being this static document with, based on this metaphor of sheets of paper, it uh, becomes a living workspace. Mm -hmm. and so. Uh, instead of just being static text and tables, you can stitch together any kind of content and paper. Um, and then you can bring people into the same environment. And so you can have conversations, you can assign people tasks. And so we're trying to think about, all right, how do you bottle up the experience of all being in a conference room together and put that in a screen? And Dropbox Paper is an example of something that's familiar, but it makes some pretty different foundational design decisions. Yeah, so I mean, being in, <laughs> being in a conference room with a bunch of people is like my nightmare, but uh, I see where you're coming from. <laughs> Um, so if you're, if you like have 500 million users' data, it seems like you you have some information about how they're using their files and what they're doing with them that could inform those product decisions, right? Could inform how what you build, what tools you build for them to manipulate those files. Are you doing any of that? Well, I'd, I'd say, I mean, for, first and foremost, privacy is the most important thing on everyone's mind. But for sure, there, are, uh, in a broad sense, we can get an idea of of patterns of behavior from our users. I mean, and, and I think we, we look at a bunch of different inputs. And so well, what's one surprising pattern you found? Now, I know, like, I'll, I'll skip over this one, so give me a different one, but, like, yeah. photos, for instance. You know, sure. the auto-uploader feature came out of, like, hey, uh -huh. people are putting a ton of photos in Dropbox. But what's another surprising thing that you kind of drew out of that that you built something off of? Well, so we, uh, well, uh, so, for example, people would, we saw that people were taking, um, or anecdotally, we would we'd get requests from people, like, hey, I'm taking photos of these documents. And they were sort of using it like a bootleg scanner. Mm -hmm. And so we saw, we, we heard that from people, we anecdotally observed that and so on. And we're like, okay, these people are not trying to take a picture the way they would be of a vacation. They're trying to scan a document. And so when we watched that pattern of behavior, we're like, okay, now we have some new building blocks here between mach machine vision, deep learning. And so what we do is we created something called a doc scanner. And when you just take a picture of any piece of paper, it will reorient and it will reorient the document for you as if you would put it on a flatbed scanner, and that all happens really seamlessly, one click, um, and then you get a scannable, searchable PDF in your Dropbox. And so that's an example of here's some, like a hack that P our users had found, mm -hmm. and then we we watch that and we're like, oh, we can make that a lot better, and then we build it in the product and ship it to hundreds of millions of people. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. I mean, that's, so that speaks to how you're developing products now. I, I would like to, um, let's rewind a little bit and talk about the IPO. 
the process of that, and then we'll talk about how that kind of affected products. So um, you were, in 2014, it was reported that there was like a roughly uh, $10 billion valuation based on the money raised reportedly. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's over official. It doesn't really matter. It's true. But, okay, very good. <laughs> I can uh, confirm that. Heard it here first, et cetera. <laughs> um, so you had a $10 billion valuation at that point. The IPO was priced down to about $7.4 billion. Did you feel some vindication when you kind of recrossed that $10 billion mark? Yeah, so we, when we went public in March, I th we, had our, we priced, I think, at 7.4 sounds roughly right, and then we traded. When we opened trading, I think it went up to 11 or so. Uh, d d of, of course, yeah, we were really excited to, um, I think the IPO was symbolic of a lot of hard work that the team had done to build a good and sustainable business. And the confidence that investors had, and more importantly, just the understanding that people had of about, about what we tried to build, it was, it, was a reflection, it was a good reflection of that. And so that, it's actually interesting, because it leads into the, this kind of idea, when you were raising, you know, while you were still a private company, raising money, because you knew, hey, we need X to do Y. Um, did you find there were a lot of headwinds because Dropbox was uncharacteristic of a lot of the companies of the era? Because, uh, you know, 10 years ago, you start out, a few years in, you're looking to raise a bigger round, and then you look around and all the other companies are in this hyperscaler, we're not going to charge for anything mode, and Dropbox is like, hey, we have a product, you know, a little bit of free, but then we expect you to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Were there headwinds raising because of that? I don't think there were headwinds raising. Um, if anything, uh, investors would kind of get out in front of a, uh, uh, get out in front of us. Um, and there's when you get to the growth stage, investment phase, there aren't that many companies, but there's a lot of capital. Um, and so, as a founder, it's important to kind of begin with the end in mind, and understand, as a private company, given our fundamentals, you know, our revenue, our rate of growth, our level of profitability. What it's important to understand where you would be as a public company because as a public company, well, as a private company, your scorecard or your report card will be things like how much momentum do you have, how excited is everyone, how many users do you have. But on the other side, when you're a public company, investors will grade you pretty clinically in terms of all right, how much money are you making, mm -hmm. and how fast are you growing, and, and how, how much are money you? can we expect you to make? Exactly. Um, and so you want to make sure that you bridge that, that gap from private to public. And so a lot of the, w we realized that um, probably about 2015 was really when we started kind of revving up the engines to go public in a serious way. But we also realized, okay, we need, um, uh, it's very, com well, even though there are a lot of companies right now that are kind of in growth at all costs mode, this is not sustainable for them or for us. And we're making something that has a lot of value to our users. And so we have the foundation to build a really healthy business. Um, but we can't, it's not going to make sense for us to keep just spending infinitely to grow um, because that incremental dollar is, accomplishes less and less mm -hmm. over time. And so what sustainability meant to us is realizing that, okay, here is, here's, what we're, here's the problem our customers have. Here's the product we're building. Here is the business model, and fortunately, we've, uh, the majority of, 80% of our users actually, or our subscribers, use Dropbox for work. Mm -hmm. And so these are customers who are using Dropbox for work at work. They're used to paying for stuff. That's, they're actually a little concerned if you're not charging. Right, them. right, yeah. Um, and so we had to do a lot of kind of tuning under the hood to make sure that we were building a sustainable business, and then we turned cash flow positive in 2016, and then we continue to ramp from there. Um, so what, there's been some debate, I mean, obviously, it's been a whole thing, you know, Elon announced that he's taking Tesla private, and he's like, JK, um, LOL, but the, you know, one of the discussions that was had in that gap of time between you know, all those things happening was what are the disadvantages and advantages of, you know, taking Tesla private or something like that. So what do you, I guess the, my question for you is what's the biggest disadvantage you found now that you're a public company? Well, I think there's pros and cons on either side. So the, 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 the advantages of being private are that you don't have the quarterly, um, or you have, a, you have a different level of, you have different investor base, different level of scrutiny and so on. Um, and the orthodoxy in the Valley over the last several years has been that being public is super onerous. Um, you're living kind of hand to mouth, quarter to quarter. Uh, you can't invest in anything long term and so on. And, and that was, and, and even like two weeks before we went public, 
like I was literally going on the road show next week. I was at a conference and someone was interviewing the head of NASDAQ. And the first question the, the interviewer asked is like, so I've heard from a friend that going public is like finding a way to live in hell without dying. What do you think? And so I was like, okay, this is like, we, are, we were very much already on that path. And so that was a little bit. Um, <laughs> it's encouraging. You know, so, but, but that's why I think it's really important. It, it, so I, step one to being a good public company or being a good uh, private company is just be a good company. So build a good business. Um, and uh, and, so, and, and as a public company, I've actually been, so, so we've gone public, we've been public for a couple quarters. Um, I've actually been surprised that there weren't more surprises. And uh, part of that is because um, w we've laid the tracks for being a public company for the last few years. And so the IPO was kind of graduation day, but all the work was uh, in the three years prior. Um, and so the, the, the advantages of being public are that, um, they're, they're su surprising, there are like actual advantages of being public compared to being a late stage private company because um, now, what every, when I think about my, my team, the employees, what they hear from me and, and the management team at an all hands, mm. and what they read in the press, and what they hear on earnings calls, and what they see in their bank account is all the same thing. Mm -hmm. And that's different from kind of the late innings of being a private company where there's no transparency, kind of by design, right? So um, the business was always doing well, but um, you know, we had this high valuation, the press was skeptical about us or competition, and, and we were kind of holding our cards really close to the vest, and so um, I think we maybe overdid it on that front. Um, but then people are also like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm holding on to this liquid stock for like five years now. Right, when people get antsy, public. yeah. And so they don't, uh, so, so it, you, you can't tell them when you're going to be public, and so people really freak out about the uncertainty there. Um, and so there, there are actually, when I sort of zoom out, there, there are pros and cons of being both a public company and being a late stage private company. And I would say that if uh, all that stuff I said about like kind of building with the end in mind and th investors wanting cash flow and profitability and growth, um, that matters because if that's not what you're selling, then you're not going to have a good time as a public company. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there are a lot of times, there, there are times in, in every company's life, no matter how successful, where you go through these strategic changes. And doing those as a, as a public company is much harder than doing them as a private company. So let's talk about strategy changes for like preparation for IPO and that sort of thing. Did you have to change your work ethic? Did you find like, hey, we're cruising along, everything's going fine, now we're preparing for IPO, you're like, I got to get my mud boots on, you know? I think, th well, the first, uh, the, the biggest challenge, well, I'd say co public companies run into problems in one of, uh, one of a couple directions, or one of a few directions. I mean, maybe the first one is if you don't have the controls and if you don't have the, the rigor and predictability in your business and you screw that stuff up, like you're gonna have, th then that's, that's, that's like SEC feds problems. You do not right. want that. And so you wanna make sure you're building in a solid foundation so that your business is predictable and so that you don't have problems closing the books and things like that. Um, and that you're not innovating <laughs> on the accounting yeah. uh, or, or legal front. Innovating on the accounting, I like <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then the, the more common problems are, in, if, are, are falling too far in one of two directions. So either, one, your, your core business is not predictable or it's not growing, and then investors get freaked out, and then that's when you really do get on a quarterly treadmill because you're not meeting their expectations in the core business. And so then they really are paying attention to every little cell in their spreadsheet and wondering why, and, and then you can have these big gyrations or big crashes in your stock if you're not meeting expectations in your core business. But then you can also fall too far in the other direction, which is you just optimize your core, you're just sort of ar harvesting your core business but not planting for the future. Right. Um, and I think what you have to get right as a public company is you have to do both simultaneously. Um, it's not either or, you have to do both. And so you have to make sure that you're building a machine that, or you, you, you can run the trains on time with your core business and that it's growing and it's predictable and so on. And then that gives you the air cover to be able to invest and, and, and plant seeds for parts of your business that will become your core business in the future. Mm -hmm. I mean, like Q2, for instance, there was a, a bit of a sell-off after the Q2 announcements, um, which, you know, happens a lot in companies. So it's not specific to Dropbox, but uh, sort of as a new, I mean, it's the second quarter, you got to look at that. How, how, 
have you found it hard to make hard to make decisions in isolation from how the stock is doing? Well, the stock is going to be super noisy all the time. And so before it came that before the stock came down, it actually went up 10% and then came down 10%. Right. Um, and so it's it is kind of a it's it's a weird feeling that pe people are kind of using your company stock as like chips in a casino. And so they're making all these speculative bets and there's all this technical trading, algorithmic trading and all these you know, your your stock looks like an EKG, EKG even if your business looks totally smooth. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think what you have to do is you certainly have to care about the stock price in the long run, but you can't pay too much attention to the little gyrations in the short run. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it seems like that that like trading volumes are high. People are definitely interested in the company, uh, and at the same time, the stock has uh, remained relatively steady since launch, which is probably a good thing. But um, once you decided to go public and you started to make these decisions about, um, you know, hey, we got to get this company ready, did you have to fire anybody you really liked? Did I have to fire anybody I really liked? No, not really. I was again, it was over the the past few years that we had been getting ready. Um, I, mean, I would certainly say that the team, the management team, has has evolved uh, a lot every every few years, and and that's true for us, and that's true for 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 most companies at scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you just uh, you have some team members who were just perfect for the company during a certain mm -hmm. stage. Totally, maybe aren't right for the future. Yeah, because in the beginning you need to build. You're, you're writing a playbook, and then when you're at scale, you're running a playbook, and those are two different, very different tasks. And so you think about, all right, who do I need to run? engineering or product in the beginning, there's no infrastructure, right? That VP shows up and there's nothing and they have to build it all from scratch. Um, and so the kind of person you want for that job is like a great recruiter, someone who's comfortable in chaos, someone who can build, someone who just figures stuff out. But then after you've built the foundation, then it becomes more of an optimization and scaling exercise. Um, it's like, how do you build the right structure and process and so on? And it's unusual for that the same person to love and be great at both of those things. Mm. Do you view Google as your primary competitor at this point? What's, well, so we have a pretty broad competitive landscape. So uh, certainly Google, Microsoft, the, the incumbents, the folks who, who own, the, uh, who own the, the major office suites, we, we compete with them. We also partner with them. So competition is kind of interesting for us. Um, it's not zero sum the way it is for a lot of other uh, for a lot of other industries because we find, we, we know that, and, and it's been true that almost since the beginning, um, all of our customers will either be Office 365 customers or uh, G Suite customers as well. And more and more they turn to Dropbox to tie together all of this, um, to tie together all the different ecosystems. And so they, they, we actually partner with Microsoft. And so there's Dropbox support in Office and vice versa. We partner with Google. So there's drop, you'll be able to, we announced in March, you'll be able to uh, store and organize your Google Docs and sheets and slides in Dropbox. And more and more, when we look at our, we talk to our customers, they're like, help us. Like, you look at their phones, they have all the apps from all the companies. They have all the Office stuff. They have all the G Suite stuff. They have all the Dropbox stuff. And they have a lot of other tools, too. And they're like, no one is helping us tile all that together. And so we see a big opportunity to, to do that for our users. Cool, and then with the last little bit we have left, so we have later on today, we have uh, a cadre or first suite of Battlefield companies coming on the stage. Do you have any advice for them to get up there and uh, <laughs> pitch? Advice for bat so I would say get more than two hours of sleep, but I think it's probably- I think it's a little late for that. that. <laughs> um, well, he here's what I would say. So our, 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 our launch, th that was not our finest moment. Like it's actually kind of hard to imagine how that could have gone worse. <laughs> um, so just know that it's a roller coaster. Y you know, there's un there's no button that a founder can press that's just like, please just make things go up and to the right. Um, and if you think of it more as an adventure, more than having to get everything perfect, um, and you just think about progress and keep moving forward, um, just make sure to enjoy the journey. Cool. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, Thank sir. Thank you. Yep.